Here we go. Hi everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly JavaScript News Podcast, uh, episode number 45. And you immediately know that we are out of holidays and everyone's back to work because I had to go through like more than a hundred articles and libraries and demos to actually make this episode. So there is a lot of things today and quite a lot of really cool articles. So let's get started. The first article we got here is a beginner's guide to GraphQL. I mean, pretty much, you know, as the title says, it is a very detailed guide for the very beginners who don't, <coughs> apologies, who don't know what GraphQL is, but want to learn it. Um, and yeah, basically, it has everything to get you started talking about the schemas, resolvers, types, and all that kind of stuff, uh, and how you can set up the very basic server yourself. It does not talk about any specific libraries, So it goes with the very, you know, the very, very basics. But if you just wanted to get into the GraphQL and you wanted to learn what exactly is that and how it works, this article will get you started in no time. So pretty good one. Next article we got here is creating a reusable accordion component that works anywhere. And it teaches you how to make a web component uh, using angular elements, which can be used anywhere without any framework. So as in, you know, proper web component. Uh, hey, Tim, welcome to the stream. I um, you have two eyes in your name. So I'm just gonna gonna pronounce it as Tim, I think. <laughs> but yes, welcome, welcome. Uh, right. So yeah, this article does um, exactly what it says. So introduces you to the custom elements, uh, shadow DOM, ES modules, HTML templates, and all that other things that relate to the web components. And also shows you how to create a new angular component and then export it as a web component, which is a, I thought a really neat feature of the angular tooling, basically includes it by default, right? So there's no uh, additional magic included, it's quite easy to do. So if you were interested how you could turn your angular components into a web components that can be reused, well, just about anywhere with or without um, other frameworks, then go ahead and have a look at this article, it will give you a good start. Next article we got here is JavaScript context, this keyword. Uh, this one is well, exactly it's talking about the context, right? So what is this? Uh, how does it ties to the specific functions, objects, methods, and so on and so forth? And um, how does it goes with, you know, with the nested objects and stuff like this? Um, the thing is, if you already understand this, you won't really find anything new in here. But if you are still struggling to figure out what this refers to in different contexts, right, this might give you a pretty good uh, understanding of some of the cases, like it's not the most detailed article about this I've seen. And I know that this is a pretty complex topic, right? It, I think it took me a couple of years to actually figure it out completely. But yeah, basically, if you don't know it, um, have a look, maybe this will clear up something for you. If you already know how this works, then well, you don't really need that anymore. So uh, yeah, there you go. Next article we got here is improve your asynchronous JavaScript code with async await. Um, it's an essentially a tutorial that walks you through, well, basically any asynchronous code handling starting from the callbacks, right? Talking about, hey, so we actually have the callbacks, which leads to having a callback hell where you have too many of them nested. And then we got the promises to solve the callback hell so that you can actually write a code a bit nicer, but that's still, you know, not as nice. And now we have the async await, which basically allows you to await promises and makes your code super nice and super readable. So yeah, if you, you know, if you understand promises, if you understand async await, you won't really find anything new here. If you are new to the JavaScript world, and you are still using callbacks and only getting into promises, then this will get you started with promises and async await in no time. So do check it out. Next article we got here is from the ARB. Blah, let me try that again. Airbnb engineering and data science team. It's called how Airbnb is what is wrong with me today? Okay, let's try this again. How Airbnb is moving 10 x faster at scale with GraphQL and Apollo. And uh, there's actually a video talk uh, from uh, GraphQL Summit that happened last month. Uh, so if you prefer video format, you can just watch it here. But uh, nonetheless, the article is absolutely fascinating. And it's essentially an inside look into how um, the Airbnb guys use GraphQL internally to do quite a lot of things, actually. So it's not just the website, it's not just UI, it's not just, uh, you know, data processing, there is some very interesting 
use cases here and some very cool things that they can actually do because they rely on GraphQL, which is, you know, the cases that I haven't even thought about, but when you read about them, it makes total sense. So if you are working with GraphQL or if you are, you know, evaluating whether you should start working with GraphQL, do check this article out. There is a lot of very interesting things in there. And I would recommend just, you know, look, if, if not reading, then just looking through the cases and uh, figuring out if you need that or not, because some of them are really, really unique and pretty cool. All right. Next article we got here is let's create a custom animated tab bar with React Native. It's a pretty basic tutorial that teaches you how to create a tab bar like this with uh, nice animations on, uh, you know, the tab switching. Nothing really out of ordinary here, just a very well written tutorial with a lot of code and essentially code walk walkthrough that shows you how you know you how you go from the very basic tab bar that has just text to adding uh, nice icons to adding the color to adding the animations. So if you're working with React Native for a long time, you probably don't really need that. It's there's nothing super complex here. But if you are just starting and if you can't quite figure out how to animate things, how to make things look the way you want, then this tutorial might give you everything you need to know about the top bars at least. So do check it out. Next article we got is understanding bits, bytes, bases, and writing a hex dump in JavaScript. Exactly what the title says. This article talks about the hex dumps, why they are useful, what they are as well, because uh, it turns out not all people are familiar with it, which I guess it makes sense, right? And um, how exactly do you create your own hex dumping script that will convert, well, just about anything you want or any file you want, let's put it this way, to the hex dump that you can then inspect in a hex editor or, you know, do something else with it. So if you're curious, do check it out. And if you hear wailing in the background, that's my cat, uh, brought me a ball and meowing at me, but okay. Um, right, so <laughs> if you're curious about uh, hex dumps and uh, producing them yourself from the essentially byte arrays, right, from the files, then do check it out, it's a pretty neat one. Next article we got is rolling your own Redux with React hooks and context. I feel like we're gonna see a lot more of those articles uh, because uh, use reducer hook in React is very powerful, right? And essentially it almost allows you to replace the whole Redux with just one hook and a bit of context, exactly as the author here says. I think we already had a couple of articles that talked pretty much about the same, but well, there you go, there's another one. Um, yeah, it just teaches you how to build your own Redux with uh, one hook and context, which is quite neat. So if you're curious how exactly to do that, then check it out. Maybe in, you know, once the hooks are shipped, we will see a lot less people using the Redux and uh, maybe relying on a simpler implementations or maybe implementing it themselves using the context and use reducer hook, right? Because this is like, this is very simple. The code itself is, is very, very small. And it's a really neat um, example on how the hooks can improve your life as a React developer. So do check this out. Right, next article we got here is the melting pot of JavaScript. Um, yeah, how do I put it? So at first I was like, okay, it's probably again one of those articles when people complain about JavaScript and not liking it and how the ecosystem is terrible and everything and blah, blah, blah. But then I noticed that this article is actually from Dan Abramov uh, of the React team who always writes a really cool articles and has a very unique perspective on things, which I absolutely love. And this article is no different. So while the start of it is sort of, you know, kind of tries to, um, I guess, ignite a flame war maybe even, but it's just a bit, a bit controversial, let's put it this way, right? The article actually talks about the fact that, well, yeah, okay, so we now in JavaScript world have a lot of tool chains, right? And while uh, those tool chains are extremely helpful, uh, a lot of them uh, sort of lean on the users and, try to make them more and more configurable, right? And here's what he says, our tools makes us, make us fat, right? So the idea is that if, if you have to use, for example, Webpack, you will need to learn how to configure it, right? And with a Webpack, uh, again, this example somewhere here in the text, he says that some tools even have a configurations that are so complex that there are books written about it. And I think that's a pretty much reference to Webpack because there is more than one book explaining how to configure <laughs> Webpack and how to write a Webpack config. So it's a very fair uh, thing to say, you know? 
And what he says is that basically he gives some pointers um, on, on how he thinks the tooling should work. So as in, you know, configuration should not stand in the way of getting started. You should be just able to install it, run it and start working immediately. This is how Create React App works, for example. This is how Parcel works. And those those tools are amazing, right? This is how Next.js works. You, you just literally install one package and you're ready to go. And this is amazing. Like I I, I think... Whenever I try to write software, I try to mimic those guys because I know they are good and I'm terrible at that. So I'm trying to be a tiny bit better with that. And uh, there's also some additional interesting thoughts as in, you know, how resist adding more configuration than absolutely necessary. And he uh, says that the developers should actually try to have opinionated decisions as in, you know, I don't want to include this flag because I think it's not needed. Um, the interesting thing is he also talks about, okay, so when you add this feature that, you know, 5% of your user base will want and will use, think about the other 95% in the cognitive overhead they will get from, you know, learning about this feature and thinking if they need it or not. So sometimes it's basically better not to include something in your project, which is a sound philosophy. And I mean, I, you know, there's edge cases as always, but it's kind of cool. Uh, there's also the point that, you know, you should be building toolboxes, not boilerplates, as in if you notice that you have the boilerplate that you copy around all the time and just update the packages and, and reuse the build scripts and everything, instead of doing that, you should build a toolbox like a Create React app that just generates everything for you, right? And you just use it with one command, essentially. So very, very good article overall on the um, JavaScript tooling. Quite highly recommended if you are writing any tooling yourself. Even if not, just have a look at it because there is a lot of great uh, thoughts and really cool references, actually. So there's been a couple of articles referenced from here that were absolutely fascinating to read. So uh, do give it a look. All right. Next article we got here is how hooks might shape design systems built in React. And this is essentially a look into how the upcoming React hooks, which should be actually released in the upcoming couple of weeks, judging by the progress in the React team, um, will change the way we design, or I guess people design components, right, for React. So right now, if you have a dialogue, there is a lot of things that you will have to do outside of it, like for example, at some points, even modifying the style for body, uh, and stuff like this. And, you know, doing this in a classic React is, well, a bit messy because you have to, you know, do it on mount, do it an update, and then do it on unmount here as well because this will actually might just, you know, might, might, might go wrong, basically. It's a bit of a pain in the ass. And using hooks, it all comes down to just two lines of code, which is kind of incredible. Still cannot, uh, cannot get enough of the hooks and just how elegant the code looks with them. But uh, yeah, so there's there's more than one example here. So if you're you know if you are building the design system, if you're building components for React, do check it out. It gives you a pretty good example of why you want to learn hooks and why you might find them useful. Next article we got here is webcam live streaming with WebSockets and Base64. It's a pretty cool example article that teaches you how to build your own live streaming service. A very basic one, obviously. By using WebSockets and Base64 encoding of your uh, video stream, right? So the idea is quite simple. You got one streamer client, it pushes the Base64 images to the server and server pushes those images to all the clients who are watching right now. It's a very basic setup, but um, I guess it will work relatively fine for a bunch of uh, clients. I mean, like it probably won't scale, you know, the way the Twitch does, but hey, it will actually work relatively okay. So the idea is very simple. You got the server, which essentially just pushes the data from clients to the viewers. Let's put it this way. And then you got the um, your HTML that gets the video and then uses canvas to actually get the current frame and dump it into the uh, data URL format. And then you just encode that and send it to the WebSocket. And that's basically it. It's very straightforward. But yes, it will work. And well, I mean, it might be a bit laggy, but that's a very basic implementation. So if you ever wanted to build your own live streaming service, do check this out. Maybe you can, you know, start with this. Next article we got is I hate JavaScript for loops. Let me tell you why. Uh, by the way, I still didn't get why author hates them after reading that, uh, but um, it's essentially a very deep dive into a uh, for loops existing in JavaScript. How do they work? How to use them? What kind of types are there? You know, the normal iteration for in, for off, and so on and so forth. 
using var using let and other things uh, and then including you know more um more optimizations like for example defining more than var let me try that again defining more than one variable in the first statement of four like you know instead of doing the result you actually define it here um there is an example somewhere below there we go so we define it right in the place I mean, I think those, you know, those sort of tricks are known to majority of people, but um, yeah, essentially it's just a very deep dive into for loops and then look at the map filter and reduce that can actually replace the for loops for you. And then sometimes it actually is way better to use those because they are just more readable basically in the long run. Um, yeah, so just, you know, if you are curious about the whole for loops in JavaScript and uh, anything related to uh, iterating over things um do have a look at this um the links uh oh God. <clears throat> sorry let me try this again the links are listed there is a description uh, sorry there's a link in the description of the channel right now it leads you to this github page and on the github you can find the episode 45 and it's the file includes all the links that you are seeing right now so just go and grab it over there all right, next article we got here is TypeScript 2.8 conditional types. Uh, so TypeScript 2.8 introduced conditional typing. We talked about it uh, at the point when there was a release, basically. As you might know, I'm not a huge user of TypeScript, so um, I know nothing about that. I can't really say you anything about that, but uh, I can tell you that after reading this article, I understood how the conditional types work. So if you are using TypeScript and if you were confused by the conditional types or maybe just wanted to learn them because you don't know them at all, this article does a really good job at introducing them and sh showing some examples and telling you how you can actually use them in, well, more or less real life um, conditions. So do check it out if you are using TypeScript. If you are not using TypeScript, well, that's not gonna be very useful to you, you know? <laughs> all right. Next article we got here is Designing the Flexbox Inspector. This is an article from Mozilla Hacks Guys, uh, and it talks about the Flexbox uh, Designer Inspector thingy that we um, that we shown, I think, two podcasts ago, or maybe the previous podcasts. Uh, so yeah, this one is pretty neat. So it basically shows you how it was done, what was the problems and challenges during the design and implementation, and all this kind of stuff. So if you're curious how it's made, then do check it out, it's always really cool. When are you working on the next website? Um, I am typically doing the development streams on Wednesdays. So this is when we're gonna do, uh, when well, we're gonna continue working. Uh, Saturdays is always BXGS Weekly with the news and stuff like this. All right, continuing. The last article we've got here today is Trash Talk, the Orinoco Garbage Collector. This is another awesome article from the VA team. And it talks about the way the garbage collector in V8 works. And you know, if, if you didn't know garbage collector is, I mean, it got pretty damn complex over time. I mean, essentially it's just your simple mark sweep uh, compact collector that you know, you find in quite a lot of languages, I think actually. But over time it evolved to allow JavaScript to run faster and uh, you know, got different things like minor garbage collection, major garbage collection, uh, multiple threads with helpers and then some other crazy optimization. So if you're ever curious how exactly garbage collection works in JavaScript, do check it out. It is insane and absolutely fascinating to read on the progress. So uh, yeah, this like highly recommended basically. Right, that is it for all the articles. Now we are coming to a smaller bits of news. Uh, the first one we got today is the fact that uh, Brotly actually just landed in Node.js and it's has already been backported to version 11x uh, staging branch and should be out in the next release, which is kind of cool. If you didn't hear, if you never heard about Brotly, it's a new compression algorithm from Google, I think. And it's like way better than gzip, uh, like I think almost, I don't remember the numbers actually, to be honest, but I think it was like a lot better than gzip, uh, especially for the cases where the data is highly compressible. They had some benchmarks somewhere, but you know what, whatever. If you're curious, just have a look. Basically the cool news is that it's now in Node.js and it's gonna be shipped in the next release. And I kind of curious if we can use it to build better and faster servers, but we'll see. All right, next thing we got here is extravagantly fast rendering with React benders. 
So um, yeah, a person tried to go all crazy um, on rendering static components, as in the component that doesn't change it, like the SVG icon, for example, right? And figuring out how do you actually memoize it, but you know, if you memoize it normally, it doesn't really give you anything because it's pure, it doesn't change it. React still re-renders the DOM, right? So he went ahead and did the global VDOM memoization, which is kind of crazy. So first of all, like it started with a VDOM, right? So it's like, okay, you just render it once, you create the component and then you, re you reuse the same created component anywhere. But then he went ahead and made the DOM memoization. So it's actually when the component is rendered, he actually caches it. And then on re-render, he just uses the same cached DOM nodes, which is kind of crazy. I don't think like you ever would need to do that because as he notes in the beginning, <laughs> He jokes about, you know, running into performance problems and saying, you're just kidding, I never had them, which, you know, it's a fair ass assessment. I don't think I ever had performance problems in React with rendering components unless they were, you know, refreshing unnecessarily or stuff like this. But yeah, it's, it's a crazy exercise in speeding up the rendering from 25 to 5 milliseconds, which is damn impressive. If you're curious to check it out, <clears throat> There is code samples, there's code sandbox with a complete source code and everything. It's pretty neat exercise, to be honest. All right, next thing we got here is the announcements, a bunch of announcements actually from GitHub. Uh, the first one being that they are now providing unlimited free repositories for everyone. Uh, and I think you could have uh, up to three collaborators. Yes, exactly. So it's a really neat offering. Um, Still, I think GitLab gives a better offering because as soon as your repos are private on GitHub, you basically lose all the open source tools, right? You can no longer use Travis or any other CI things for, for that because the, the private repos are only supported by the paid tiers. While on GitLab, they give you unlimited private repos. They give you up to five collaborators, I believe. And uh, you also get free um, free pipelines. So... Yeah, um, they like GitLab, in my opinion, still has a better offer. Um, how do I find these articles every week? Well, I'm subscribed to a bunch of people on Twitter and I subscribe to a bunch of news and, and Feedly and whatever. There's like a ton of things. But yeah, it's like I typically go through over 100 articles to actually find the good ones, <laughs> which sometimes can be a bit painful, you know. Uh, GitLab rocks, great article. Yeah, GitLab is really good. Uh, GitLab is, I, I mean, I'm hosting majority of stuff here purely because they give you so much things for free, which is kind of incredible. But okay, continuing. The next feature GitHub shipped is the profile status. I still have no idea why would you use that and why would you need that? I guess there are some cases, but um, yeah, it's just like you can now set profile and there's already been a lot of silly jokes about that, but <laughs> there you go. Right, next thing we got here is a pretty cool insight from the GitHub um, development team, I guess. Uh, the GitHub now natively ships codes like class foo extends HTML element, which is, you know, the HTML elements and classes, as well as a sync await without any compilation or translation or whatever. So that means that the GitHub users have browsers that are modern enough to support all of those features, which is damn awesome. Um, unless you are, you know, doing something very enterprisey and relying on super old browsers, I would say you could do that too, because I mean, GitHub is, you know, pretty good measure of um, your typical developer user, I guess. I mean, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't say that the normal users have the same browser versions, but hey, you know, that's uh, pretty cool anyway. Okay, uh, next thing we got here is a repo called Nefarious LinkedIn. The title is, well, very clickbaity, and I think it's straight up wrong and, you know, saying that link, uh, LinkedIn spies on its users, but that's not the interesting bit. So just ignore all that, okay? So the article actually here, or the repo, talks about how LinkedIn detects extensions and actually prevents them from accessing the LinkedIn itself. Now, um, it's pretty understandable to see why the author decided that the LinkedIn spies on the user this way, because, you know, if you fingerprint the extension the user has, you can actually create a pretty detailed profile because those are relatively unique, right? In addition to all the other data. But um, 
in a discussion, the Hacker News, the guys uh, who are related to LinkedIn was like, okay, we actually don't do that to track. We actually do that to prevent malicious extensions from accessing LinkedIn and, you know, like the marketing spammy extensions that will allow you to do uh, like a lot of uh, messages to whoever people matched or, you know, basically anything that can break the LinkedIn uh, will... Uh, they prevent it, right? Okay, and uh, this is a look, aside from the introduction part that says about spying and everything, this is actually a look on how they do that and how they detect uh, the extensions, which is really, really interesting to see. And I wonder how frequently they update this code because I'm sure the malicious extension developers also um, try to, you know, kind of thwart this and work undetected. So it's, I, I'm guessing this is a continuous war, but it's nonetheless pretty interesting to see that there are ways to actually detect extensions. And there seems to be a lot of them. I believe in Hacker News, there was discussion that the LinkedIn detects about like 50 extensions or something, which is insane. So yeah, if you're curious to check it out, some interesting stuff in here. Right, next thing we got here is a TypeScript roadmap, January to June, 2019. It's a new ticket that uh, outlines the roadmap for TypeScript for the next half of a year. Microsoft has been doing amazingly well with uh, dev teams, you know, facing towards the open source community. And this is just another example of that. So if you are using TypeScript, if you are curious as to what is coming uh, in the near future, then do check it out. There is some really great outlines here, some really great descriptions and um, following discussion is also pretty cool. So do check it out if you are into TypeScript. Next thing we got here is lazy loading the intersection. Of, oh, God damn it. <laughs> Let me try that again. Lazy loading with the intersection observer API. So I thought it was a really neat uh, use case for the intersection observer and uh, yeah, it's like, it's a very basic idea. So if you never use intersection observers, basically um, the idea is that it reacts when something gets into the view of the user, right? And the idea is that you can use the intersection observer to actually load, uh, dynamically load the data or images or whatever you want once the user scrolls to them. So um, yeah, there's, there's an example over here. If we, If I go a bit down, you will see that they, I guess they are loading a bit too fast on my connection and you can use it for uh, the endless scrolling as well and stuff like this, which, you know, is quite easy. It's a neat, neat little article. So if you are curious, do check it out. Do I have any videos for backup restore from Docker volume? Uh, I mean, that would highly depend on what do you have inside of a Docker, right? Because otherwise you just mount a volume, run the export command into this volume and you're basically done. And the same goes for restore. So. It all comes down to the tool you want to backup restore. You know, is it database? Is it something else? I like just look at the guides for your specific uh, database, I guess. Probably it's the database, right? This is typically what you want to backup and restore. Okay, continuing, we got using worker threads in Node.js. Uh, this is a very brief tutorial on how to use the worker threads. Uh, they are still experimental, so you need experimental flag there. And uh, yeah, I did a video on this quite some time ago. We did the, I think it was uh, factorial something in a ex ex worker. So this pretty much the same as generate prime numbers here. Yeah, so you know, if you're curious about worker threads in uh, Node.js, do check it out. It's a pretty good intro. Uh, you can also watch my video if you prefer the video formats. Uh, but yeah, it's quite nice. Right, uh, this is it for the tiny things. Uh, now we are into the releases territory. The first major release of the week is React PDF version 1.0. And I actually believe there's been more updates already. Yeah, there's been two more versions released. But uh, yeah, so React PDF, if you've never seen it, it's a library that allows you to create PDF files using React uh, like Marco, or I guess using React itself. It's basically a React PDF render, right? It is really neat. It allows you to build PDFs using JSX, which looks very nice. And you can create PDFs that basically look like whatever the hell you want. Here's for example, uh, Luke Skywalker CV, because why not? So if you've never seen it, do check it out. Now it's uh, version 1.0 and ready for consumption, I guess. Uh, so yeah, quite neat. Next release we got here is Dome.js version three. The, as the title says, provides best-in-class server-side rendering, tree-shaking builds, improved service layer integration with can-query logic, and more. 
Um, I never used Dun, so I can't really tell you much about it. But you know, if you ever used it, then you probably know um, about this. It's usually like, you know, another one of those web frameworks. I'm not sure how it fares or compares to anything else. So, you know, won't really comment. But if you're using it, check it out. If you are not using it, well, maybe have a look. Maybe this is what you were looking for. Right. Next thing we got here is Atom 134, a new minor release of Atom uh, with commit previews, improved diffs, commit message templates, and um, just a bunch of other minor things. Atom releases has been so unexciting in compared to the uh, VS Code releases. And my cat is literally in front of my face right now. What's up? What do you want? Um, right. So yeah, um, next release we got here is Storybook version four. Let me try that again. Storybook version 4.1 need for speeds, uh, faster, 300% faster compatibility and convenience release. So yeah, it seems like it's just, you know, minor improvements, primarily the speeds, as well as the React 15X supports, as well as the Create React app supports, uh, as in support of all the features directly in the storybook, which is kind of neat. So if you are using storybook, uh, you should probably update because it seems to come with a bunch of really useful things. Uh, if you never use storybook, it's a really nice, um, how do you call it? I don't know. It's Man, how do you call it properly? UI component, okay, they call it UI component workshop. That's, that's a good description. UI component workshop that allows you to have all of your components in one place and play with their properties and stuff like this. So uh, pretty neat, do check it out. Next release we got here is anime version 3.0. This is an animation library and um, yeah, the 3.0 added a whole ton of things, including the migration to AS6 modules and new build process. And now they have a new fancy website that uses the library itself to do animations like this. Look at this, this is so slick. I've used the, I think version one at some point, it was quite nice. Uh, and the syntax is like super easy to use. So yeah, you know, if you were looking for animation framework, do check it out, it is quite good. And um, you can do quite a lot of really crazy things, including the keyframe animations, which is like, look at this, <laughs> look at this stuff. And it's, it's literally very easy to do. So yeah, uh, quite neat, check it out. Right, so this is it for the releases. Now we are coming to the library section and demos section. So we got some uh, interesting libraries and some really awesome demos uh, closer to the end of the episode, but Let's get started. So the first library here is string similarity. Um, it's a, so there's a bunch of string similarity libraries for node, but this one is not using Levenstein for once. It's actually uses Dice's coefficient. Uh, Dice's co coefficient. <laughs> I forgot how to pronounce this word. I'm terrible. Okay, but whatever. You know what I mean, right? So um, which apparently uh, I think it's supposed to be better than Levenstein in majority of cases. So there are some edge cases I believe that it doesn't quite work out. But uh, you know, for the typical use cases, probably this is what you want. Quite nice, uh, pretty small, and works on both uh, strings. Uh, you know, phrases, whatever the hell you want also can look for the best matches uh, and stuff like this and written in AS6 and everything. So quite nice, do check it out if you are working with strings essentially. Next thing we got here is dmatch.js. You remember this viv.js thing from the last time? There's this vaguely div thing, it was terrible, right? This is another thing from the same author. This is terrible 3D images. <laughs> So if you ever wanted to put horrible images in 3D to your website, now you can do it with this library. And um, I <laughs> I don't know why, but there you go. Just, just, just have it, yes. Okay, next thing we got here is Finn, uh, the ultralight Node.js HTTP clients. Um, just as it says, it's a pretty small HTTP client that can do just about anything you want. The main uh, difference between, you know, request and just about anything else is that it's just 17 kilobyte in comparison to even node fetch, which is 150 kilobyte, which is kind of damn impressive. So if you ever look to build a very, very small Node.js app, do check it out. This is kind of neat. Next thing we got here is create react blog. Start and deploy your own statically rendered blog with Create React App. So it's a sort of extension of Create React App that allows you to build a blog based on Gatsby uh, using MDX and Navi, 
which I mean, it looks pretty nice. So, you know, if you ever wanted to start a blog but was too lazy uh, building your own Gatsby thing, then there you go. You can just use this and you will get your own nice blog that has, well, just about everything you want, basically. So, yeah. Next demo we got here is use hooks. We already had it, um, I think a month ago or something. Uh, this is a nice website that basically lists various um, cool hooks that you can use in your React uh, applications. And now the website has been open source. So you can actually have a look at how it was made. I believe it was made by Gatsby, uh, using Gatsby. Yes, indeed. So if you ever wanted to have a look, um, do check it out. I mean, I guess the content in this case is more important than the website itself, but there you go. Maybe you were curious. Next thing we got here is uwebsockets.js. This is um, from the team that made the uwebsockets. Uh, at one point, they actually, I think there was a library like uvs.js or something, and then they discontinued it. And now we have this. So this is actually um, not just a library. It's a JavaScript platform runtime and web server built on top of the uwebsockets library, which is the C, C++ library, right? And you can use it from Node. It comes with pre-built pre binary, so you don't have to build it yourself, which is nice. The thing is they have this benchmarks data here, which is kind of insane. So if you compare uh, basic Node.js uh, to the UVS, uh, thingy here, right? You'll see that the difference is, well, I don't know how many times, how many, this is like, I don't know, 30,000 requests per second, per, or is it, is it per, per second? Yeah, so Node can handle like 30,000 requests per second, while the UVS can handle 180. So yeah, six time difference. This is a bit insane. So if you were, you know, if you're working on something with the WebSockets and you needed something very efficient, do check it out. This seems to be really cool. Next thing we got here is JSON server. Get a full fake REST API with zero coding in less than 30 seconds. Seriously. So uh, I never heard about this library, but I found the idea to be absolutely awesome. The idea is simple, right? You install the JSON server globally as a binary. Then you create your DB JSON file that has some like posts, comments, profile, whatever. And then you just start your JSON server over that file with watch, right? And you get a full server where you can, you know, normal rest server where you can like do post get and delete patch requests, whatever to any of those endpoints and add change or delete the data in the file directly, which is really, really cool idea. So if you ever needed a quick development server for your UI, you can now do this like this. I would, Definitely not use that in production, but for development purposes, this is really cool. I also should start that, so there we go. All right, next thing we got here is Cache, a better in-memory cache for Node and the browser. Um, yes, just what it says in memory cache with some additional uh, useful features like the resolver uh, that it has over the keys and functions. Um, nothing really super amazing here is, you know, your typical in memory cache uh, with just additional nice APIs. So uh, if you're needing that, do check it out. Another thing we got here is the FLRU by uh, Luke Edwards, a tiny 215 bytes and fast least recently used cache. This is slightly different also in memory cache, but it's a least recently used one and it's supposed to be very fast. If you, if you ever heard about Mr. Luke Edwards, you know that he typically does very tiny, very fast things. And well, this is not an exception. So if you ever needed um, FLRU cache, then we'll check it out. The, there's the benchmarks at the bottom, which are well, qu quite crazy as usual. So yeah, seems to be quite, quite damn good. Um, so yeah. Next demo we got here is data prefetch link. Uh, it's an extended link for Next.js that actually allows you to prefetch a page, not just, you know, the date, not, not well, God damn it, let me try this again. Not just the render of the page, as in the what the Next.js does typically, right? When you query the page, it will pre-render the uh, page itself. And then when you load the page, you will actually get the initial props, load the data and re-render it with the proper, uh, included data. Well, what this aims to do is this gives you a link that actually invokes the get initial props and gets the data and pre prefetches it with the data, which is pretty damn crazy. So yeah, you can literally just, it's a drop-in replacement for the Next.js link and you can literally use with the data parameter 
proper property to uh, actually fetch the data, which is kind of great. So do check it out if you're using Next.js. Next thing we got here is Karen, an elegant promise-based HTTP client for browser and Node.js, still work in progress, so not version 1.0, so beware of that. Um, it has a pretty interesting syntax. I don't know if I like it or not. I, it actually feels a bit weird to me, but the idea is that you use the get and post methods as the uh, template literal, uh, what was it called? Template literal functions or template literal? No, wait. I forgot how you call those, but basically you can use them as prefix for template literals. And this is how you essentially construct a request, right? I mean, for get requests, it looks kind of okay, but when you start doing post requests and writing the body right in the string, it just starts feeling a bit weird. I Maybe it's just me. Maybe, maybe I'm actually just overthinking it, but actually, you know, looking at the more complex requests, like with the content and with the headers and everything, this actually looks way better than the simple one. So maybe there is something to it. Tag template literals. Yes, thank you, tags. This is what they are called. Okay, uh, next demo we got here is Trillium, your personal knowledge base with Trillium nodes. And it seems to be like the local knowledge base that you can set up at your own server or local machine or whatever, and then use it to collect things. I, you know, if you are uh, like to set, if you like to self host everything, then maybe you want this. I, I don't know, I, I've kind of become too lazy for that. And I typically just buy the services that I like. Maybe I should start self-hosting again. I don't know. I just sometimes I don't have time for that. But there we go. Next thing we got here is the MovieDB, a promise-based JavaScript API wrapper for the MovieDB.org that works in a browser and Node.js. So if you ever wanted to build something on top uh, of the MovieDB or you know maybe make your own website about the movies, well now you can do this with this library. It seems to be quite nice. So you just need the API key from the MovieDB and you can just go ahead and use it. Uh, supports version three and version four. And uh, yeah, basically quite nice. All right, um, next thing we got here is the programming fonts app. Uh, this is a really neat app that allows you to compare different existing programming fonts right in the browser and see which one do you like more. There are some that are um, weird, and you know, at least for for my taste, some of those look really, really well. Like this one is so condensed, I can't even understand what's happening. But again, you know, this is I know the fonts are very personal. There's a really neat um, app that will allow you to pick the one that you like. Uh, there are some really good ones here, so I don't know. Maybe I feel like maybe I should just sit here and click on all of them and figure out the ones that I actually like. I do like the default one in the VS Code most. I think I think it was like Source Code Pro or something. Uh, yeah, that looks like it. So this is probably my favorite one. But yeah, there you go. So you can just uh, check out all the, I believe those are even open source programming fonts. So you can just grab that and have a look. We are being hosted by Rambling Geek. Thank you, Rambling Geek, for hosting me. I have no idea what's happening, but you know what? I'll take that. Right, uh, next thing we got here is uh, the new resource called This Week in React. Well, I, I don't think it's actually new because it has 15 issues already, but I thought I would highlight it because I never encountered it before. And the idea is that it covers basically everything that happens in React ecosystem over the week, which is, you know, you know that your framework is really big and really popular and really complex when you have to have a separate mailing list just to tell people what exactly happened in one week, which is, yeah. So, you know, if you're using React, um, you can just follow uh, Philip uh, Spice here and, uh, or I guess Spice maybe, uh, and uh, yeah. He's, he's on React Dom team and he does this Twitter summaries, I guess, which is quite interesting. Uh, so I guess I should follow him as well because, uh, oh, there was a follow button there and I just missed it. There we go. I do need those news to deliver them to you guys. All right. Next thing we got here is the uh, WebAssembly experiment, uh, which is written in Rust, right? So there's the balls jumping around the screen and they actually have collisions. So those are colliding balls. There's a bunch of examples. So uh, compute by JS and render JS into HTML. So you can also shuffle them. You can see the delta and frame rates here. Um, I would also want to see the average delta and average frame rate over the past whatever seconds, because this is just weird, you know, and it's jumping all over the place. I see that there's sometimes like 70 FPS. Um, not sure 
Not sure because I can't really notice it due to the speed of the change of these things, but it's, you know, basically you can see that it's not exactly that efficient, especially when calculating the uh, collisions, right? You get the same JavaScript compute and JavaScript render into Canvas, which actually performs slightly better, has less slowdowns and stuff like this. Uh, and then you got a bunch of WebAssembly ones. So compute by WebAssembly, render into HTML, compute by WebAssembly, render into Canvas, and then direct WebAssembly rendering into Canvas and into HTML, which is, again, I probably would notice difference better if there would be some sort of a chart and averages over the past whatever seconds, because this is like, I mean, I guess I could see that WebAssembly probably performs better, but it's a bit, you know, it's a bit hard. <laughs> It's a bit hard with the bare eyes, but there you go. It's a really neat experiment. And you know, if you're curious, there is a source code on GitHub, so you can just go and uh, clone it, fork it, um, and check it out yourself and play around with it. Next demo we got here is, oh yeah, this is probably one of my favorite ones. It is, so this is um, Vinforms from Mono, right? So the C-sharp Mono stuff, because the C-sharp guys have started playing with, um, WebAssembly for, or has been playing with WebAssembly for quite some time now. And well, this is the mono of informs compiled down to WebAssembly and working in the browser. So you actually have all, this is not just image, right? This is actual informs and I can actually click things. And, and, uh, oh God, it's frozen now, no. Okay, so it's not the best performance, right? But uh, let me just refresh it, I guess. Um, but it does work, which is the most impressive thing about it. It does work and you can actually drag things, you can press things, you can check boxes, you can press buttons and all of that stuff actually works. And okay, there are some artifacts and whatever, but the fact that you can take um, WinForms and compile them to WebAssembly and then they just straight up work in a browser is blowing my mind. Like this is incredible. Uh, we'll be curious to see if we could at one point compile one of the existing Windows applications uh, just to work the browser. I mean, obviously you would have to f like mock the file system and stuff like this, but uh, pretty exciting nonetheless. It is indeed very cool, yeah. So, um, I mean, this <laughs> WebAssembly is keep getting better and better. So, you know, from Doom 3 to this to... Well, just about it. I'm, I'm kind of curious if Epic Games will take a leap and also make Unreal Engine compiled to WebAssembly because they did the ASM.js demo with Mozilla in the early days uh, as, you know, one of the first adopters essentially of ASM.js. So I'm curious if we're going to see Unity and uh, Unreal Engine compiling to WebAssembly. That will be very neat. I guess we need the uh, threads first for that and probably some more WebGL features. I believe that what the people are from the gaming develop from the game development were complaining about mostly. But okay, that is it for the demos. I got a couple of uh, silly things for you before we close this off. The first one is the website that I absolutely love. It's called http.cat and it is a collection of HTTP cats. So if you ever need a cat for your status code, you can just um, do this and you will get yes, 200. Okay, this is just Perfect. I mean, look at this. This is the best website you can you can ever find. This is internal server error because of course it is. And uh, the last thing is this joke about um, JavaScript numbers and the fact that they are actually, <laughs> this is the thing that I, I also am not sure I get every time people complain about the JavaScript numbers, right? Is the fact that actually JavaScript, um, confers to the IEEE 754, right? So it's an existing spec that is used in like majority of languages and all of them behave the same and JavaScript is not an exception. So yeah, I think maybe this is the way I should answer to people who say that the numbers in JavaScript are bad and everything, but so there you go. <clears throat> Essentially that's it from my side. So as I uh, as I said before, you can find all the links and articles and everything mentioned today on the GitHub repo uh, under building X with JS slash BXJS weekly. This was episode 45. The link is in the description to the channel video or podcast you're listening or whatever. Um, that's basically it from my side. If you guys in the chat have anything that I might have missed this week, or maybe you have some questions, or maybe you have... I don't know, suggestions, your projects to share, whatever, feel free to throw it into the chat right now. Uh, if not, we can just wrap it up here and go have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week, depending on when you are watching or listening to this. 
And uh, yes, Trillium is amazing. You already managed to try it. <laughs> well, good to know. So there you go. Chat says Trillium is amazing. So go ahead and try it. Maybe you will like it as well. Right. Doesn't seem like we have any more questions or suggestions. So thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for supporting me as always. Thank you for following, for all your comments. If you want to talk more about JavaScript, if you want to learn it or, you know, stuff like this, uh, do feel free to join our Discord server. We are always there to help. Uh, I am most of the time there. I'm more than happy to discuss new things, look at your code, help you with your problems. And there's a bunch of other people who can do the same. Um, there is... Uh, there is no, I mean, there is a website, but it's not quite finished yet. You can um, use it to navigate this thing. So there's the BXJS website repository, which leads to BXJS uh, codesend.net website, which includes the episodes which are rendered, but it's not like I'm working on it and I'm streaming the work on Wednesdays. Uh, so, you know, if you want to, <laughs> If you want to check it out, do check it out, but don't expect anything amazing just yet, but we're getting there. There's going to be a really good website at one point with search and everything, but for now it's kind of, eh. yeah. So there you go. All right. Um, looks like that's it. So thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. Have a great weekend and an awesome week. I see you on Wednesday for the software development stream and I see you next Saturday for another BXGS weekly and maybe for some games at some random point whenever I feel like it. So there you go. See you guys. Bye.